On today's podcast, we have J.D. Burke. He is the managing editor of EP Rinkside, Elite Prospects, overarching, wonderful uh, writing that they do on prospects from all over the world. We've already had Mitch Brown on our podcast in the past. Really enjoyed this. Uh, what did you think, Dan? Yeah, it was cool getting to talk to him. Never spoke to J.D. Uh, before, so it was nice getting to you know, learn his story He's definitely put in the the time, the sweat equity to get where he is now. So well-deserved from his end and uh, learned a lot. Just a really interesting um, look at, you know, how scouting is seen from the inside and inside out. So really enjoy this chat. How about you? I uh, loved that he's kind of getting behind the curtain. So it's about as close as we'll all get to seeing what NHL scouts do, how they go about it. And it was just uh... – Pretty cool thing about how he broke down skating into small pieces as well. So there, there was a lot of good stuff here. Really enjoyed it. I'm excited to get into it. Without further ado, our interview with J.D. Burke. Today's podcast, we have J.D. Burke. J.D. is a jack of all trades in the scouting space. Uh, you probably have talked to everyone in the NHL by now that's on the scouting front. Have you not? You know what? I'm getting pretty close. I uh, We were doing an article series, or I was doing an article series, where we looked at some of the players on the Elite Prospects draft board for 2020. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a funny experience for me because, you know, without, I don't know if this sounds like egotistical or, or like I'm, you know, bragging or whatever, but there was definitely a moment in that process where I'm going through my contacts and I'm collecting all this information on why these players that we ranked didn't go in the draft. And, and next thing you know, I'm like, I'm in touch with about somewhere between a half and two thirds of the league's uh, teams, whether it's an individual regional scout or somebody on their analytics staff or somebody who uh, is, is the director of scouting themselves. So uh, certainly getting up there and uh, you know what, I, I feel bad for all of them. They're just the same, but uh, you know what, they're, they're all great people I've found and, and really eager to talk hockey. I mean, I think that's the one thing people really don't, uh, don't get and and perhaps you know it's not their fault that they don't get this but like these scouts they just love to talk shop in my experience and and it, it's a truism that holds for general managers uh, for analytics staffers and 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 you'd be surprised how often they want to get your opinion uh, they want to get the opinion of the the people they're talking with and 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 get as wide a field of information as possible uh, to help inform their decision making process and there's a bit of a quid pro quo sometimes it's uh, it's really been a cool experience and really happy to find myself in the middle of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Before we get too far down the rabbit hole, though, J.D., hoping you could give our listeners a little bit of background just about how you ended up at Elite Prospects and what your journey's been like. It's It's been quite the journey. I mean, that's that's definitely the word for it. I mean, it's it's kind of funny, but my entire career is the product of, of one exceptionally uh, lucky accident is, is how I would describe it. I mean, I, I, I was painting... Uh, I just moved out. I think I was 20 years old at the time and 20 or 19, something like that. And I was just watching a football game and, and I'm going on Craigslist because I'm so dissatisfied with my nine to five job, uh, not really getting by especially well. I mean, the, the, you know, every kind of, I guess, stereotype about a young, a young guy trying to strike out on his own, right? Like finding new ways to rotate between ramen and craft dinner, you name it. I was, I was going through it There's all. There's only so much variety. There's only so many different ways you can do it, right? And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm I, I got really creative, but uh, I didn't want that to be the future. So uh, there I was looking at opportunities on Craigslist, and and before you know it, I stumbled upon NFL writer. Not even not even hockey, just NFL, and uh, it, it was for an American website called Opposing Views. I hope nobody looks up the the contents of my work there because I mean there, there needs to be a new word introduced to the English dictionary for the sort of dread that a writer feels when they come across their their old work. So please, nobody take up that opportunity. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I I basically saw the listing and I said to myself, you know, there was one thing I got I got right in high school it was English writing and and you know. Uh, combine that with an intense passion for the NFL. Uh, it, it seemed like an obvious fit, and it wasn't like a full-time job or anything, but I was getting paid, and and it just kind of snowballed from there. Next thing you know, I'm talking to them about getting some NHL content done, and then after that, I'm talking to them about becoming a, an editor for NHL content, and, you know, eventually I've got my own personal blog, now luckily deleted, so you guys uh, can't find that work, even if you tried. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I had my own blog going and, and eventually um, 
you know, just by, by reaching out, I mean, I think networking is such an important part of this job. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's really important for anybody who does make it in so far as that's a, a thing, right. To, to be cognizant of is, is just how lucky they get along the way. Uh, and certainly I was the beneficiary of a lot of luck, whether it was finding that NFL listing in the first place, or as I'm striking out into the Vancouver Canucks sphere, uh, connecting with people like Thomas Drance, like Dmitry Filipovich, like Reese Jessup, uh, just really kind of ingratiating myself to some of the brightest minds in whether it was prospect analytics, whether it was uh, just just creating new formulas uh, for the NHL at large. Uh, these were some of the, the smartest minds in the field. And I was so exceptionally lucky, lucky to get in on the ground floor with these people. And, and it just kind of, you know, at some point I said to myself that this was going to be my career. And, and I think it was at Canucks Army where I really realized uh, that the, this was something I could do, that this was going to be my pathway out of dissatisfying manual labor work. And, and I didn't really have an education. Uh, I didn't have a stockpile of riches to fall back on, but I had an unbelievable work ethic. And that's one thing that I will, uh, you know, not, not feign any modesty on, right? You know, I was working two or three jobs at a time for all of my 20s and making some extraordinary sacrifices to get where I have. And uh, you know, getting lucky along the way too. And, and you combine those two factors and everything kind of worked out, you know, and, and uh, the networking component again, you know, I met Shane Malloy, who's one of the, the OGs of the scouting community and the public. And through all these connections, eventually I, I, I kind of stumble upon Elite Prospects Rinkside and, and I'm introduced to Peter and I just saw overwhelming potential with the platform. And, and I tried to communicate that to him. I said, we need to focus our coverage. We need to stop doing everything uh, half, well, not half-assed, but pardon my, my language there. We, we need to stop doing a little bit of everything poorly and we need to really focus our coverage. Uh, it's in the name, prospects, elite prospects. There is no reason that this platform can't produce some of the best written draft work uh, on the internet. And, and that was really my, my pitch to him was, I'm gonna get our crew focused on, on doing one thing and doing it exceptionally well. And, and I looked at our price point too. This was a large part of what influenced that decision. I said, we can't be charging what we are. I mean, it's, it's a totally great product. You get access to 20 to 30 premium features, whatever, but we cannot charge that on the content side and try to compete with the media giants out there. That, that just wasn't feasible, not with our staff, not with what resources were available to us. And, and that really resonated with him. And, and that really kind of seemed to strike a chord and, and I've just had nothing but the most overwhelming, uh, institutional support from Peter Sibner, from Johan Nielsen, uh, who's a founder of Elite Prospects. They, they really respected my vision. They let me fill out the staff with people who I thought were qualified to help us execute on this vision. And, and really it was, you know, within a month of reaching out to Peter, he said, look, here are the keys to the website. Uh, let's, let's make it happen. You know what? It wasn't always easy. Being a uh, ambitious startup on the internet is, you know, it, it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of community building, reaching out, and 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 exploring new avenues to create an audience. And and we we've done that. I think this year was hugely successful. And uh, you know, I, th I think we're just so excited about what the future is going to hold because we've got. Uh, some more some more announcements on the way on the other side of the calendar year in terms of staffing, in terms of what we're going to be investing in the website. Uh, it's it's really been just the the privilege of my lifetime, uh, frankly, and and all the luck, all the hard work, it's all added up to a posting that I couldn't be more happy to have. And uh, you know, just just exceptionally grateful to everybody who's played a role in getting there. That's fantastic. I'll keep this next one short and sweet. I'm genuinely curious, like what's a day in the life look like today? I'm sure there's quite a bit of variance, but like what, what was today like, for example? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, well, every day is more or less the same right now, a sentiment that I'm sure holds for the vast majority of our audience and I'm sure yeah. you two gentlemen as well. You know, I mean, for me, it's, it's I think part of what has made this job so successful or this, this, uh, this company so successful under my stewardship is just kind of being given the, the creativity to do what I, what I feel needs to be done and having the support to do that. So no two days are alike. It's, it's always completely different. It's, it's, I get to what I have the capacity to get to when I have the capacity to get to it. And, and, you know, I think if I were to draft what an ordinary day looks like, 
right now it's a lot of producing video clips and gifts for our, our social media platform rink side to try and grow that. Uh, so that's, that's always something that I do to start my day out. And I already have the files from, from putting them out there on my own account the night before. So no worries there. I'll, I'll do some isolation tape, uh, work, you know, I'll chat with some of my league sources, get, get a lay of the land. Uh, you know, I'll try to squeeze in a, a little in-house workout and, uh, that's, I, I can't wait for gyms to be open again. I can tell you that much right now. Right. I may not look the part, but, uh, <laughs> that's that, that almost speaks to how, how much I'm eager for them to return. And then I'll nap in the middle of the day and, uh, I'll wake up and, and, you know, it's, it's usually in the back half of the day that I get my, my writing done. And, uh, you know what, that, that works for me. And, and it's, it's, I don't know, every day feels, I mean, in, in much the same way that everybody kind of feels like we're, we're experiencing groundhog day together. Uh, having that sort of freedom allows me to kind of avoid getting too mundane, if that makes sense. So, uh, that's, that's what I would say the, the framework of a JD Burke work day, uh, looks like. Sounds like an optimum little day, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, we'll keep it. We'll keep this next one vague on purpose. Also, when when you're watching a game, you can pick the level. What are you What are you looking for? I'm looking for everything. For me, it's it's a it's such a holistic process. There there is so many different ways that you can slice this. I mean, it, it depends on which player you're watching. It depends on which game you're watching. It depends on whether it is a back to back. Is it the second half of that game? Uh, the level of competition, like these are all factors that go into contextualizing what I am observing. Uh, but, but I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know what, it's funny, you, you left it open and now my, my mind is going in so many different directions that I'm having <laughs> a hard time focusing on where to go. But uh, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, for me, there, there are a few really crucial elements. There's skating. Um, and, and I find this one to be a bit contentious, uh, even among my own ranks. You know, like David and, and Mitch, uh, sorry, David St. Louis and Mitch Brown, uh, they, they have a different view of skating. But for me, I, I do tend to ascribe to the belief that if you can't skate, you can't play. Uh, so that's a really important one for me, particularly with the direction that the game is going in. Uh, I like to look at somebody's, you know, and, and, and there are differences between isotape viewings and, and being in the rink. But, you know, when I'm at the rink, for example, I'm looking at how they support the puck. I'm looking at how they support the transition. I'm looking at their off the puck movements. I'm looking if this is somebody who is critically engaged in the game uh, for the entire entirety of the 60 minutes, right? And, and uh, you know, I think everything kind of stems from that, right? If you're watching how they skate, if you're watching their uh, off the puck support, if you're looking at their defensive zone and offensive zone instincts, uh, defensive habits, like these are some of the things that I key in on. And, and, you know, I, I can key in on certain things to better degrees or worse degrees, depending on the setting. You know, for example, uh, something that's really important and, and I think that, that doesn't, get enough, uh, doesn't get enough discussion when we're talking about who's a, a good rush defender, uh, who's a bad rush defender. I think so much of it is focused on the outputs uh, and not enough of it goes into the inputs. And what I mean by that is, is are they mitigating risk with their footwork? Uh, are they are they settling deeply into their stride so that they have the mobility to change according to what's in front of them? Uh, but most importantly, at the crucial moment when a player is carrying the puck into the offensive zone, what sort of posture and what sort of footwork is the defenseman uh, deploying in that situation? And that's one, for example, that uh, for me in particular really stands out in live viewings. The way that a defenseman uh, defends through the neutral zone. And that's, that's such a crucial part of the game in, in, in the modern context. So, you know, I, I wish there was a really easy way to, to kind of underscore what it means to have offensive instincts or defensive instincts. I think most people would just describe that as hockey sense. Uh, we kind of try to veer away from using the word hockey sense at elite prospects because it's, you know, Mitch came up with the perfect slogan or, or idiom for this. He says, uh, Hockey sense is like borscht. Everyone has their own recipe. Right. And it's it's very vague. And I almost feel like sometimes it's vague on purpose. Um, so <laughs> we try to stay away from that and, and talk about on the puck offense, off the puck offense, uh, supporting the play, those sorts of things. And, and I think that all those kind of things together uh, go into the stew of analysis that uh, that boils over, uh, what, a 60 to 80 game season and, and kind of produces the... Uh, 
I don't know, the bowl of hopefully a hearty NHLer. Right, absolutely. If you'll well, allow I'm, me that horrible analogy. No, I, I, that was that was lovely. Uh, I'm sure we'll dig into hockey sense, hockey IQ. It, it is such a hot button topic, and I think you're right that it's sometimes vague on purpose, um, as almost just like a catch all word. But before we get there, I'm I'm curious. Like you obviously have a, a very fluent understanding of the game, and, and I'm not asking this as as like some sort of like validation or anything. But did you play when you were growing up? Like, what was your? You said you were a diehard NFL fan earlier on. Um, did you like play and watch hockey your whole life too, or is this something that kind of came about like later? I, I I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, so uh, my story uh, as it relates to hockey is is probably relatable to so many people out there. I, uh, you know, my my poor mom, she she was adamant that her son wasn't going to play hockey, and she was adamant that she wasn't marrying someone who liked hockey as well. Uh, psych move on both of those fronts. Uh, <laughs> as it goes, my first words were shoot scores, so uh, no dice. Uh, you know, I my my old man, he he you know what, he pulled off the fib just well enough, clearly. And and I was playing hockey by the time I was about five years old. Uh, my old man was a coach a lot of the time, uh, you know, really, really sharp hockey mind. It's it's actually kind of funny. I give him a ton of credit. He was, he was preaching concepts that have now taken uh, a hold of the game. I mean, one of his, his truisms that I remember was hockey is a game of keep away. And that was something that he would always say. And, and it was something he said through all levels. Uh, you know, it's a possession game. You either have the puck or you're chasing to get it. Uh, which which part of that do you want to be? And and that was something that he placed a lot of emphasis on. And so, yeah, I, I played hockey for from pretty much my entire childhood. Uh, I eventually transitioned to playing in goal at the ripe age of, uh, you know, 13, uh, much to the chagrin of, of both my parents this time. Uh, it's a very expensive position to play. And, uh, you know, I, I just stuck with it. I wasn't very good. You know, like I never got to rep. I never got to, to do the, the, the really important tournaments. Nobody has scouted me. I can guarantee you that much. Certainly not intentionally. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, once it kind of dawns on me or, or it dawned on me that this wasn't going to be a career, well, there, there were two things that kind of hit on that front. There was the fact that I wasn't especially good. And then there were concussions and, and concussions really kind of took it out of me. I, you know, I think after about my fourth or fifth, by the age of 23, uh, it was, it was that point when the doctor was like, mm, you know, you probably shouldn't be playing anything even vaguely similar to like competitive hockey. Uh, so, you know, uh, that, that, that's kind of the end of that tale, I suppose. And, uh, you know, from there, I just, I, I, wanted to stay in the game in some capacity and I think that kind of dovetails nicely into my writing career and even my scouting one to some extent so yeah I did play the game uh in spite of all the people who tell me otherwise regularly on Twitter and uh you know what I, I I've kind of much you know I don't tell my doctor this but I, I'm playing beer league pickup again and uh, um or I was before the world started ending and I'm looking forward to getting back into a rink hopefully next fall what's your doctor's name and uh, if you could provide his email, that'd be great as well. I'd love to send him this episode. <laughs> you know what? I'm sure he wouldn't. He's gonna mean mugging doctor as soon as you walk in the office there. <laughs> oh yeah, he's Prairie Stock too, uh, from Saskatchewan. So I think he would get it. I would hope he would get it anyway. He'll get it, but he'll definitely roll his eyes. Um, but before we move on, I, I just want to get a small dig in here. So back in 2014, you said Brent Burns should not switch to D. Uh, why did you say that? And uh, do you feel like you're reading your words now that he's been in the Norris candidacy for a long time? Yeah, so I, you know what, when you guys were talking to me about doing prep for this show, I was astonished at the level of work that you guys had done. I mean, I, I don't even remember producing that take. And, and you know what, that, that might be a self-defense mechanism within me, keeping that, that awful, odious, uh, terrible take from my consciousness as a protective mechanism to kind of keep my ego safe. Because how wrong was I? You know, I, I look, that was, <laughs> this is such a cop-out answer, so please forgive me. Uh, I've come a long way since then. And I think that all I can do is, is, is take the L as graciously as possible. I've come a long way as a scout, as an analyst, as a thinker, uh, definitely as a writer. Uh, so I, I think that 
That take, if I remember correctly, was informed by the lack of forward depth in San Jose and what happened when they did transition Brent Burns to forward and how it changed the complexion of their forward group. And, and I think that was what kind of informed that hapless, terrible take. But uh, you know what? Beyond that, I've got really nothing to add. I just, you know, got to tip my cap to you guys for doing excellent homework. And uh, again, just take that L. <laughs> but, but that's why you're great, right? The people that are willing to take that L are the ones that go the furthest. Uh, they commit their wrong and learn from it. So I, I like that about you. So I'm curious maybe about your process of scouting, what it looks like now compared to back then. Well, it's, it's actually useful information, I would like to think now. <laughs> You know, I, uh, you know, I, I do think though that you struck gold with that 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 remark that it's uh, you know you got to be willing to learn and and accept your mistakes and and try to understand uh, why you made those mistakes and and I'm good friends with with Reese Jessup who is of course of hockey Twitter fame for uh, Barzell Shillington and and Connor tweet fame but uh, also a, a great a great scout for the, the Florida Panthers. And, and, and I'm sure he's going to get back in the NHL in no time at all. And whichever team uh, brings him into the fold is going to be richer for it. But he, he, he said something on, on the elite prospects podcast with Craig button <clears throat> uh, that, that we host. And, and it really resonated with me. It was, it's not so much about looking back at your mistakes and, and trying to retcon reasons for why you hit, why you missed, you you can get too far, you can get too high on your own supply, if you'll allow me that 80s-ism. Uh, but what you want to do is look at your mistakes and say, which one of these were reasonable to make? Which one of these mistakes can I say, honestly, was the appropriate one to make based on the, dis the information that I had to inform that decision? And, and I'll give you an example of the application of that sort of maxim. Look at Tyler Johnson, okay? And Tyler Johnson is a player who every time, whether you're a scouting guy like I test or, or a stats person, uh, the invocation of, of Tyler Johnson by either side is enough to make me pull my hair out every time. There was no indication on the tape he was going to be good. There was no statistical indication he was going to be good. There's no model out there that suggests that Tyler Johnson had second line NHL or potential within him. Missing on that player is a mistake that you don't need to feel bad about, okay? But if you look back and you apply that same logic to, to other players, for example, oh, geez, what's, what's one that works Yakupov for me? Yakupov is, uh, is one of my favorites. Yeah, sure, Neil, Neil Yakupov. I, I mean, that, even that would have been a mistake that you don't necessarily need to feel bad about making. But it's, it's the ones where you find yourself missing bits of information that would inform a better decision. That is the problem. And, and I'll give an example to that end. I think about Adam Gaudet, uh, Vancouver Canucks example. I remember when the team drafted him, I thought to myself, what a wasted pick. You know, I was so, I was so overwhelmed by the data revolution in the prospect world and all that it could do for uh, mining amateur talent. And, and I was so excited by it. And, and I, I kind of lost the force for the trees a bit because I remember about a 2% PCS and that was Cam Lawrence and Josh White's box uh, model. And I believe Reese Jessup and Garrett Hole put a little bit of work into that one as well, which basically looked at the comparables of a prospect, their cohort, and, and looked at how many from that group went on to play in the NHL. Adam Gaudet's number was 2%. 2% likelihood of developing into anything at the NHL level. And for me, that was the end of the conversation. And what I didn't look at was his role on the Cedar Rapids Rough Riders. I didn't look at the context of his points, which informed this model. And, and this model, by the way, every draft analytics model is based on about two or three different outputs. Uh, so, so big lesson there was not getting too overwhelmed by the data I was seeing through those models, because even the people who create them would tell you that there is a limit to the efficacy of these models. Uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing that always kills me. Like if we created a model for the NHL that was based on perhaps two or three statistical inputs, it would get laughed out of Twitter immediately. And you have people, myself among them, on the Adam Caudet pick who took it as gospel. And if I had looked at more information, if I had looked at the role he played in Cedar Rapids, if I had looked at 
uh, his skating, if I looked at his offensive instincts, all these little details that I just kind of ignored because uh, he wasn't jumping off the screen in my viewings because the statistical output wasn't great. I don't think I would have reacted as negatively to that pick and I would have had better analysis for the trouble. And that's another L that I just have to take. So it's, it's constantly learning. It's constantly, you know, who watches the watchman? It has to be you. You have to be constantly looking at your work. You have to be constantly following up on the players that you have assessed, constantly following up on those assessments themselves and just being transparent and honest about that. I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm not surprised this article series didn't hit because it's very inside baseball, but I put out that article series about the players we put on the elite prospects draft board who didn't get drafted. And, and that for me was such an important series to show that we are open to criticism. We're open to exposing the, the, the framework of our, our analysis to, um, to, to contrary opinions, to, to kind of get all the inputs necessary to make the best decisions. And, and I think that that's something that I pride myself on doing a lot of the elite prospects is opening up our work to as much criticism from people within the game as possible so that I can continually assess my own assessments. Uh, as Craig Button would say. And, and I think that that's really when you start cooking with fire is when you're not only assessing the players, but you're assessing your own assessments. If I'm allowed to use that word even one more time in this show, uh, I will tip my cap to your grace. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's important for coaches or players too. You know, you always have to look honestly at your performance, what you like, what worked, what didn't work and, and try your best. Uh, I mean, especially with young players, um, not to do what you did with the Brent Burns and kind of just bury it deep down there and hopefully you don't revisit it, but take it as a learning opportunity. So uh, I'll take one more opportunity to dig, dig you on that one, but rightly so, um, but, but continuing on this exact same line though, you, you've talked with a lot of the town evaluators out there and you've had access to them many times over. You've seen them through their process. What, what really separates the good from the great out there and, you know, what gets you excited when you talk to someone, you're like, oh, this is a great talent evaluator. It's a good scout. Well, I mean, uh, that's, uh, it's tough for me to answer because I'm always, you know, like I, I, I had a moment at the Holinka Gretzky. Remember when we could travel? Wasn't that nice? Uh, this was in Breslav in Czech Republic. And, you know, uh, and of course, I, I'm in the stands. And next thing you know, it occurs to me, there's Rick Nash. There's Steve Eiserman. And there's always getting past that for me, you know, and, and it's just, I, I approach everything in my life with a little bit of childlike wonder. And, and I always have to get over that hurdle first, you know, to be like, oh, wow, I'm talking to this, you know, I'm talking to Hakan Anderson today, or I'm talking to Darren York the next day. Uh, and, 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 you know, so, so kind of flipping the switch so that I'm evaluating them. That's an interesting ask. I will do my best though. I, I find that the ones who most impress me with their work are the ones who, you know, in much the same way I was saying that you have to constantly be evaluating yourself and evaluating the way that you look at players and, and, and thinking along those lines, you have to be realistic. And, and what I mean by that, too, is, is I had a conversation once with, with Darren York, uh, and, and, and Carolina Hurricanes fans are going to love this. Uh, you know, they took, they took Alexander Passion and Zion Nubik in the fourth and sixth round. And I think they had another player who profiled relatively similarly between the two as well. Can't remember his name for the life of me. Um, what really struck me about the conversation with, with Darren York about these players after the draft was the way that he was realistic. And, and so you talk to somebody after the draft and they think they've unearthed, if they have seven picks, they think they've unearthed seven NHLers to varying degrees. Uh, that, that, that is alarmingly how often that goes. But some of the smartest people in the industry, they will tell you, for example, as Darren York did with these three players, I doubt one of them will, will hit, right? Because that's the odds. You look historically at fourth to seventh round picks, uh, you know, it's, it's not great. But conversely, if you stockpile enough of these players who profile this way as boom or bust and you hit on one of them, 
well, then you're, you're all the richer for it. And in the occasion that you do hit on two of them, because the criticism he was kind of referencing was the idea that he drafted too many of the same player. That's that, that was the genesis of this conversation. He said the odds that, that all three of them hit are, are microscopic. And if they do, my job is to bring assets into the organization. What happens beyond that point is up to our development staff. It is up to our general manager. It is up to the people who are in charge of those decisions. And I thought that was such an intelligent thing to say. I really did. I, I was, I, I definitely had to kind of give him a respectful damn dude. That's, that's a pretty good outlook. And, you know, like I, I, I would have do not drafted. Uh, I would have hit them with the DND grade, both of them, Zion Nubik and, and Alexander Pash. And I don't think there's a hope in hell either of them play in the NHL, but you have enough ammunition late in the draft. You can start taking swings like that. And if, if that's your guiding philosophy at that point, I mean, at a certain point, I get that you want to find NHLers because there's a, a self-preservation element. Like you don't want to be the scout who's constantly saying, let's take home run swings. And then 10 years down the road, you don't have a single NHLer to your credit. I get that. I get that self-preservation element to an exceptional degree and I empathize with it. But by that same token, and this is something Mark Yanetti said uh, to me in another conversation, uh, you, you don't move the organization forward by finding fourth rounders or fourth liners. You don't move the organization forward by finding uh, number six or seven defensemen. Like these are not the players that are going to help uh, move the organization. He, Yanetti is always telling me, JD, I can find 10 of that player on waivers every October. And, and, and that, that was another line that really stuck out to me as being very intelligent and forward thinking and progressive. So I, I think basically the, the, the scouts and the executives who, who take the most honest look at their own work, the ones who are willing to say, hey, I'm probably wrong here, but if I'm right, it's going to do wonders for the future of our franchise. Uh, the degree to which I'm right could vary. Uh, that, that always sticks out to me anyway. I like that. I, I actually had that conversation with my brother um, a few times when we were looking at organizations that we like and don't like. And it was the ones that take more home run picks and just realize there's a, no offense to the players out there, but there's a million fourth liners that you can find. You can find those bubble guys. You got to get the game changers. You got to take some risk. Um, I don't know how you felt about, I don't, I don't like to date this, but Caden Gooley, of Montreal. I, I feel like that's a guy that really isn't hitting the home run. You're not really taking too much risk on that. It was more self-preservation of, you know, you know, he's going to be solid, but never great. So uh, even I would push longer. back. I would push back. I, I, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds here, but I would actually push back on that. I, I think that Caden Gooley was a totally reasonable pick in that spot. And uh, such a unique combination of, of physicality and skating and, and just the ability to neutralize a cycle at the snap of his fingers. I mean, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's unique. That's, that's a really interesting quality. And I, I actually think that there's a bit more offensive potential there than people give credit. And, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record because I made this point so many times, but I remember, you know, back in that, that Holinka Gretzky tournament that I was watching, uh, King Gooley outplayed Jamie Drysdale for a large stretch of that tournament. And, and you never want to get like too caught up in small samples or whatever, right? That's, that's no bueno, uh, international tournament or otherwise, but I do think proof of concept matters and, and has some value. So uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I am the noted Caden Gooley Stan of draft Twitter. Uh, I am one of his most uh, strident defenders and uh, I had to avail myself of that opportunity there. Absolutely. We'll have to go back and see uh, who was right and who was wrong here in about five, six years, right? Yeah, probably me on the wrong file. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you're the expert here. That's why we got to bring you in. So I've got a question here that's a little more uh, nuanced, I guess. Um, it's around kind of the measurement of improvement. So, you know, how do scouts, coaches, players, and parents kind of measure each player's improvement um, how do you take those snapshots? How does that fit into the scouting process when, when teams are looking at players? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a miracle really... or are you just kind of looking, Oh, they look better. You know what? It's, it's going to sound pretty, uh, silly. It's going to kind of devalue our own work here, but a lot of it is they, they just look better. And, and I'll give you an example. I mean, Thomas Bordalo, uh, of course we will never shut up about him at elite prospects as we had him 
uh, pretty high. And he, he seems to be rewarding our conviction on that front, if you'll allow me that opportunity to pat my own back. But, you know, watching him right now, I mean, his skating looks so much better. And, and so I, th I think there actually might be a little bit of a numeric component here, at least for how we do it at Elite Prospects, because we submit our grades on a player's tools. So skating, shooting, uh, hockey sense, physicality, all that stuff. We update that about once a year. And, and you know, it, it is informed, though, not by any one particular number, by, but, but, but by, what, by what we see. And in the case of Thomas Bordalo, he's getting a lot more depth through his stride. He seems to have added some lower body strength. You know, I can't remember his skating grade off the top of my head, but uh, just based on what I've seen thus far with Michigan, he's somebody who would grade out far higher than he, he did in, in our last meeting going into 2020. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you're just looking for those inputs. You're looking for little changes. And I mean, if you're, if you're looking at a player, for example, I don't know, like a, a John Jason Paterka, uh, second round pick of the Buffalo Sabres in October. I, I think for us, it's like when you look at the checklist of items that go into his skating stride, you would uh, you would look at his recovery. You would look at the depth of his stride. You would look at his hips. You would look at the three-point flexion from his ankles, knees, hips. Uh, you would look at all those inputs. And then as you're taking notes in your game reports, your player reports, you're starting to make notes of what shows as as good and what shows is bad and what you're kind of looking for as you go through the years is is he addressing the items in the cons ledger and so you know for john jason paterka uh reigning in his, his upper body you know he's got way too much wasted momentum through his shoulders and through the the, the center of his mass uh he recovers a bit wide he's still a very good skater but he's the one who i can remember these obvious fixes for and so <clears throat> what you would do is you would look at those obvious fixes and you would say, is he addressing them? Can I see visual improvement through this series of games? And then I suppose in our case, you would adjust the measure of his skating. Would you see maybe like uh, Daryl Buffer has talked about success rates and, and teams or maybe you heard rumblings about teams on how they're able to put numbers to people. I know Mitch has got the CHL project and you can tell as the season goes along, kind of which people are trending in the right direction. You almost like take snapshots or what are maybe some processes people are doing that you've heard of, not, you know, beyond just what you, you guys are doing there and maybe what uh, some of those NHL teams that we all want to hear about the what's going on behind the curtain there a little bit. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. I'll lean into this insider role that I've been uh, so graciously bestowed. Uh, you know, I, I think that it really – we, we try to basically articulate a lot of what's happening in the NHL with what we do. Um, and, and so, it, frankly, it's, it's a pretty similar process to what we do at Elite Prospects because we let that inform our work. Uh, you know, we're not obviously beholden to whatever, what an NHL front office does, what an NHL scouting department does. Uh, but we want to approximate that process for our audience so that they can get a glance into the decision-making process of an NHL team, whether it is grading out a player's skating or whether it is, uh, you know, evaluating their progress year over year. So, you know, I, I think again, it's it's the same thing. You're you're going through your chest your your checklist of items, you know, and and you're going have they addressed, you know, for example, somebody's top heavy, they collapse at their hips. Uh, that's in the cons ledger. Okay, is that something that we can see improvement on halfway through? Uh, draft plus one season, first season within our system. Uh, no, okay, well, that's something we're going to keep focusing in on. And, and I think that that, in my experience, and I've had far fewer conversations about this, this sort of part of the development and, and drafting framework, uh, admittedly, but uh, as I understand it, that's, that's generally what goes into it, is just constantly going across that checklist seeing what parts of it they're addressing, what parts of it need work and how they address it with their development staff and how they kind of, you know, provide easily digestible bits of information to the players as well. So, <clears throat> for example, I was talking to, to Jack Rathbone last year in Harvard. He was getting talked to by the, the Canucks developmental staff uh, pretty much around the clock. And what they were doing was they were checking in on his tape and they were saying, here are parts of your game that we think you need to, to improve upon. And here's how we think you can do it. And, and in my experience, that's generally how they get to, to the development angle when you're talking about a player that's, in this case, all the way across the continent. 
is, is you basically, you keep that checklist, you find out which parts of the information within that list they can easily convey to the player, what sort of easy fixes can they communicate, and they just keep drilling it into them over the course of a season until they get them in their development camp and they can try to instruct them on this stuff. So it's it's a pretty kind of, uh, you know, it's it's a process that that is constantly growing, constantly evolving. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't know what the word is here, but a lot of learning on the fly from everyone involved. And uh, there's there's no perfect formula. Every team does it differently. But that's also why we don't really, you know, I think development is the one part of uh, the draft that we don't know how to properly evaluate yet. I think the lack of information that we get from NHL teams, and I say this is somebody who's relatively uh, connected, if I can lean into that <laughs> again, um, I think that that's one part of the, the game where we just don't have enough information uh, to really evaluate teams. And I think it makes a huge difference. And, you know, to that end, Rachel Dowry, who works with us at Elite Prospect, she's doing a thesis, I believe, on, on player development. So I'm really, uh, really excited to see what she, she produces because, as I'm saying right now, it's such an inexact science and uh, we're learning so much of it on the fly. We'd love to get her on to talk about that. It sounds like the next step, you've got the first one and she'll take it home from there. Oh, uh, oh, totally. She'll, she'll blow my interview out of the park. She, she's so incredibly smart, does such great work for us. And, you know, I, I think my only ever quarrel there is getting her to do more of it. You know, I mean, she's so busy with her thesis. I, I, I'd never get a, enough Rachel Dory on the, uh, you know, on the ledger at Elite Prospects ringside, but uh, certainly uh, I can't can't say enough about what the work she does do, like in terms of the scouting reports, in terms of the information she brings to our meetings, uh, would thoroughly endorse her as a guest for this program. Awesome. Um, but yeah, it was great having you here. We'll give you what I give everyone else. Um, you, you may have started with it, talking about how great EP is and, and what you guys are going to do, but two minutes to plug anything you want and then give us a, a book recommendation or two. Right now, we're doing our team-by-team -team prospect pool ranking where we use our future value uh, metric to kind of inform uh, the value of every single prospect. It's a holistic, one-size-fits-all one grade to kind of set a more scientific approach to our work of uh, evaluating the draft and looking at these players and what value they have to organizations. So uh, we're going team by team, and we're going to be covering the World Juniors live and in person, assuming that still goes forward. And, you know, I, I've got no idea what it's going to look like moving forward, but uh, half the fun will be, be learning that process along the way with us as we get uh, new information ourselves. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to keep working on that team by team series, doing some great work on the World Juniors. There's the Elite Prospects podcast with uh, J.D. Burke and Craig Button. And and in the new year, I think we're going to start diving into some 2021 work as well. And and for a book recommendation, uh, To Have and Have Not by Ernest Hemingway. Why not? He, he's my favorite author. I love that book. It's so great. Check it out. Awesome stuff. Well, again, appreciate you coming on, taking the time here and, and showing us a little bit behind the curtain on what EP is doing and whatnot. And we're excited to uh, ring in the new year with you. Thanks so much for having me on. I think you guys are doing great work and I uh, was really happy to join the program. Thank you for tuning into the Hockey IQ podcast. We are Hockey's Arsenal, Greg Rivak and Dan Ducart. Together, we've come together to create a platform and a community to expand on hockey intelligence, hockey IQ, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're very passionate about seeing this game played smarter and better and continue to develop itself uh, to the next level and staying on the cutting edge of things. So you can find us at Hockey's Arsenal on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're also at Hockey'sArsenal.com. Uh, from there, you can find some resources and some options to work with us. We're excited to continue this. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, follow, and share. Uh, you can also join up for our newsletter as well, where we're going to tackle anything Hockey IQ related. So we're excited to have everyone here and continue to build